woman is killed with an extremely rare poison. She was gone. There was no more coming back to see Mama. Authorities believe the evidence led to a brilliant, reclusive neighbor. George isn't mad. He's a genius, but he's not mad. I don't believe in a million years that George Tree Powell is guilty of first degree murder. It was beyond coincidence. The circumstantial evidence was damning. A Florida poisoning case from 1988 seemed to have all the ingredients of a mystery novel. There was a terrible crime and what appeared to be a twisted genius with something to prove. But this real life whodunit lacked a few elements. There was no smoking gun, confession, or even a fingerprint. The authorities had to make up for it with what often carries the day in such cases, a back-breaking investigation. It was an investigation that began at a surprising point before anyone had died. Alturas, a small community in central Florida. In June 1988, a mine worker named Pi Carr received an anonymous letter in the mail. It was typewritten on a post-it note. The 44-year-old Pi showed it to his stepson, Dwayne. Pi said it's just a gag, and uh, he handed it to me, and it, it said, you and all your so-called family have exactly two weeks to move out of the state of Florida or you will all die. The note ended with, this is no joke. Pi also showed the note to his friend and minister, Robert Grant. I said, I just couldn't imagine anyone in the community that, you know, would want to hurt him. And I said, I, I think I just, you know, forget about it. So he did. After all, Alturas was a safe farming community, dotted by cattle ranches and orange groves. It was real nice and quiet and you always smelled oranges and it's a place that you might want to raise your child, you know, and start a family. You don't have to worry about locking your doors. Didn't seem like there was any threat at all out there. Besides, at the time, the Carr family had other worries. Pi and his 41-year-old wife, Peggy, had married just a few months earlier. Both had children from previous marriages. It was a quarrelsome household with four kids in their teens and early 20s who did not get along. To be honest with you, we weren't very close. I mean, we weren't like the Brady Bunch at all. Everybody was always arguing. There was always turmoil around the house. Pi and his new wife were also feuding. Peggy suspected that her husband was having an affair. Peggy worked at a local restaurant as a waitress with her daughter Sissy. On Sunday, October 23rd, 1988, she woke up early for her morning shift. When Sissy arrived that afternoon, Peggy told her she wasn't feeling well. She had chest pains and her legs ached. Sissy sent her mother home to rest. Peggy's teenage son, Dwayne, found her lying on the couch. She was like out of it. She didn't know what was wrong with her. She had complaints about her chest, she had complaints about her feet hurting her really bad, and she couldn't walk at all. By evening, Peggy could barely speak and could not open her eyes. She was taken to the hospital. After several days of testing, they could not find out anything. And she said, Bob, the doctors have said maybe it's psychosomatic and that I'm just imagining this pain. But she says it's so real and she described the pain as it had worked its way up her legs and into her back. Peggy showed signs of improving after a few days and was sent home. But the mysterious symptoms quickly returned. She was incoherent. You couldn't even talk to her. She had to write stuff down because she was hurting so bad. And uh, all she could say was, my feet are killing me. Peggy was rushed to Winter Haven Hospital. At the same time, Pi's 16-year-old son, Travis, and Peggy's 16-year-old son, Dwayne, started feeling burning sensations in their feet, just like Peggy. It's like when your feet go to sleep, then when they're about to wake up, it kind of hurts, you know, and you got to move around, you got to stomp your feet or whatever. It's that feeling, but it was like intensified a hundred times over. I was just crying until they put me in the hospital and I got something for pain 
Me and Travis were both just crying like two babies. Doctors speculated that the Carr family may have been poisoned with a heavy metal such as arsenic. Peggy, Travis, and Dwayne were all in excruciating pain. It wasn't until Peggy started losing her hair that one doctor came up with a more remote possibility. They may have been poisoned with a deadly chemical called thallium, an element once used in rat poison. It was so deadly, it was banned for that use in the early 70s and restricted to a few industries. Thallium is odorless, colorless, and undetectable through standard screening tests. The doctor's hunch was right. Peggy, Travis, and Duane were all victims of thallium poisoning. And when they finally got the answer, then that didn't seem to help too much because who would do this to us? Peggy had ingested twice as much poison as the boys. She gradually lost all ability to communicate. At that point, nothing could be done. Peggy slipped into a coma. Travis and Duane also started losing their hair. Travis was soon on a respirator. Detective Ernie Mincy of the Polk County Sheriff's Office was assigned to the case. The type of poison used to poison the family was very exotic. It was, it's not a poison that is found on anybody's supermarket shelf or in their kitchen cabinet. Authorities searched the car property. They tested the well water and examined hundreds of items in the house. Under the kitchen counter, they found an eight-pack of Coca-Cola in glass bottles. Four were empty. Tests revealed that the empty bottles contained traces of thallium. This discovery confirmed everyone's suspicions. It was no accident. At that point, it became not an environmental investigation, but a homicide investigation because the doctors had told me that her chances of survival were none. The investigation would soon lead to a suspect, an eccentric next-door neighbor with an IQ in the genius range who was well-versed in chemistry. American justice will return in a moment. In October 1988, a mystery unfolded in the small central Florida town of Alturas. 41-year-old waitress Peggy Carr, her son Duane, and stepson Travis had all been poisoned with a soft drink laced with the deadly chemical thallium. Polk County investigators needed to find an answer fast. There was still that realm of possibility that it was a product tampering case. Then I have more than it's this family at risk. I have basically thousands and thousands of risk. Product tampering is a federal crime, so the FBI joined the case. The FBI lab quickly determined that each Coca-Cola bottle had been individually opened, laced with the poison, and then resealed, nearly impossible to do on a large scale. It seemed there was no factory tampering, but that someone had targeted the Carr family alone. Investigators shifted their focus. Pi Carr was the first natural suspect. Investigators learned that his seven-month-old marriage to Peggy was in trouble. He happened to be out of town on a hunting trip when the initial signs of poisoning appeared. His stepson, Dwayne, was suspicious. It was just too coincidental for him to be gone the same exact weekend that all this took place. Everybody gets sick. But detectives decided it made no sense we could establish no motive for him to, number one, poison Peggy Carr, number two, poison his own son, who he dearly loved and who was the most serious of the two teenagers poisoned. Tests also showed that Pi himself had ingested some of the thallium. I wouldn't hold thallium powder in my hand. Anybody that had enough knowledge to do this crime wouldn't ingest thallium and take that risk. They just wouldn't do it. Investigators decided to widen their search. 
The Carr family was unsure who bought the eight-pack of Coca-Cola. So detectives looked for someone else who could have placed the poison bottles in the home. Anybody could have come in the house. The back door was never locked. If we go out by the pool and then we come back through the house and we leave, we never think about locking the doors. There wasn't really a lot of time to be able to get to the household where you could be guaranteed somebody wouldn't be there, which required pretty much to either be somebody in the household or next door. Investigators began to take a closer look at the only neighbors in the vicinity. 39-year-old George Treepel and his wife, Diana Carr. No relation to the Carr family. Recently, there had been squabbling between the neighbors. At times, Dwayne and his stepbrother got on George Treepel's nerves. We were just kids. We'd always pop firecrackers, we'd always play loud music, and we used to go down to, to the lake and ride our three-wheelers and then come up his side, ride in his little grove, and, and just, uh, we basically tormented him. Only days before Peggy Carr had become sick, she and Trepal's wife, Diana, had exchanged harsh words about the loud music. Diana come out, and they just went at it. She started screaming and cussing and yelling and just didn't match what was going on. She was way too mad for the situation. But were the couple enraged enough to want to poison their neighbors? If so, they were a most unusual pair of killers. Both George and Diana were members of Mensa, a social club for people with IQs in the top 2% of the population. Diana was a murder mystery buff with a busy career as an orthopedic surgeon. Friends described her as a workaholic who dominated her husband. Diana is a doctor. I have other friends who are female doctors, and it seems to be kind of universal that the men that they marry, they do overshadow. Sometimes it's better to have someone who's a little bit more submissive so that the two of you can get along. Detective Ernie Mincy interviewed Diana at her office in Bartow, Florida. She explained that the cars were not their type of people, but described the confrontation with Peggy as an ordinary disagreement. Mincy and his partner, FBI agent Brad Brecky, caught up with her husband, George, at home. According to the detectives, Trepal acted strangely and spoke with a nervous stammer. He talked openly about his animosity toward his neighbors. Detectives thought this could be a motive for murder. He went into multiple stories of trivial things that he, to him seemed to be very important things about loud music and problems with the teenage kids and so forth next door. Trepal also had a curious response to one of the detectives' routine questions. Why would someone want to poison your neighbors? The same question I'd asked to many other people. And the normal standard response was, I don't know. I have no idea. His response was, someone wanted them to leave. Trepal's comment seemed to be a clue. It was strangely similar to the threatening note the Carr family had received, a note that had not been made public. George Trepal, unlike his wife, did fit the typical portrait of a poisoner. Early on, FBI profilers provided a description of the killer as an intelligent, passive person who avoids direct confrontation. There was no doubt as to Trepal's high intelligence. He was a self-taught chemist and a self-described computer programmer, though he did not hold a job. An old friend reported that Trepal had a long history of using drugs, such as LSD and speed. He had also reportedly experimented on others using homemade hallucinogens. At one point, he and another friend took a cross-country trip, and they took some cookies along that were laced with drugs, and they would pick up hitchhikers and offer them to the hitchhikers, who would eat them not knowing that they were taking drugs in their body at that, when they ate the cookies. And they thought that was great fun. Trepal also had a criminal record. In 1975, he had been convicted for conspiracy to manufacture amphetamine for sale and distribution. 
He had been the chemist in a major, major methamphetamine laboratory in the southeast. George had told people in prison when he got out, he was going to get back into the methamphetamine business. One element often used in the manufacture of methamphetamine is thallium. Trepal told investigators he had no knowledge of the poison. But the suspicions about Trepal were not confirmed by those who knew him best. His friends Bill and Holly Horton described George as a Buddhist with a deep respect for all living things. I myself saw him catch bugs and put them outside, ones that I would stomp. I mean, I know he was very, very caring about life and uh, caring about his cats. And I just don't see George set out to try to murder someone. George is a very good friend, so I, I, somebody I could always count on. If I needed a hand with something, hey, George, boom. Even members of the Carr family saw Trepal as harmless. I thought he was just a nerd. He always stayed cooped up in his house. He was always nice, and, and he would wear some of the most outlandish outfits you've ever seen. Like come out to get his newspaper, he'd have on black socks with some slippers on and shorts, you know, he was just, he was just weird. Whoever did poison the Carr family would soon be facing a murder charge. Dwayne Deberly and his stepbrother Travis would survive, but Peggy Carr never came out of her coma. On March 3rd, 1989, her husband, Pi, signed the papers to shut off life support. For some reason, why, I don't know now, but I watched them unplug the machine from my mom, and she slipped away, and well, it was terrible. I just lost the most important thing in my life. We left, and they closed the curtain, and that was it. She was gone. Peggy Carr's death raised the stakes for authorities. Had George Trepal's disputes with his neighbors motivated him to poison them? Or was he an eccentric genius who only looked guilty? Investigators had no evidence and one exceptionally smart suspect. So the Polk County Sheriff's Office decided to send a detective undercover to gain Trepal's trust and hopefully answer the question, who killed Peggy Carr? In the spring of 1989, authorities in Alturas, Florida, were investigating the murder of Peggy Carr. She had been poisoned with the rare chemical, thallium. The Polk County Sheriff's Office had a prime suspect, George Trepal, an eccentric neighbor with a criminal record. He had an open disdain for the Carr family and was thought to have a working knowledge of thallium, but they had no evidence linking him to the crime. So the sheriff's office sent Detective Susan Gorek undercover. Gorek was unassuming and easygoing, qualities that would encourage Trepal to open up. But before meeting her suspect, the detective did some research. One of the things that we did in this case was actually going through garbage and pulling every kind of record that we could find on Mr. Trepal. We had someone ride it on the garbage truck and mark the bag that came from that house. Both George and his wife Diana belonged to Mensa, a high IQ club, and participated in the group's social events, which sometimes involved elaborate role playing. My character name is George Trepal. My real name is Wango the Great. In April 1989, the couple organized a Mensa murder mystery weekend at a local hotel. Detective Gorick decided to attend under an assumed name and identity. She became Sherry Gwynn, a timid woman trying to separate from an abusive husband. FBI profilers thought Sherry was a person that the suspect could relate to. The detective arrived for the event and prepared to meet George Trepal. Working undercover is a lot like being an actress. You put on a face and you rehearse your lines and then you ad-lib a lot. That's the only way that you can deal with being friends with someone that you know is suspected of committing such a horrible crime. 
Participants in the murder weekend were assigned characters. They dressed in costumes and followed a script enacting various murder plots. George Tripal wrote a booklet used at the event called Voodoo for Fun and Profit. One section read, most items on the doorstep are just a neighbor's way of saying move or else. The wording reminded investigators of the anonymous threat sent to Pi Carr that warned, move out or else you all die. Tripel's pamphlet explained that people who receive such threats should know that their food or drink could be poisoned. During the event, the undercover detective approached Tripel. She found him to be pleasant and engaging. He was very easy to talk to. He was a little bit like a encyclopedia. You could ask him anything and he could just talk for hours on any subject. He was very intelligent, a little egotistical. Detective Gorick heard Trey Powell say he was planning to sell his house. She seized the chance to develop a relationship and told Trey Powell that she was in the market for a new place. They arranged to meet the following week. They were soon friends, often talking on the phone. Gorick recorded the conversations. Hello? Hey, George. Yeah. This is Sherry. Hi. At first, the undercover operation yielded no incriminating facts. Tripal never brought up the poisoning. Their conversations were run-of-the-mill about his daily rituals or his cat. Well, I have a new kitten who's quite good. You do? I found her in orange grove in front of the house. What have you named her? Tiger Lily. Little by little, through phone conversations and picnics in the park, Susan Gorick got to know George Tripal, his moods, how he thought of himself. During one meeting, Tripal confided that he felt like a divided person. And there's a bit of my brain which I call dementia. Because it just sort of sits in the background and really understands what's going on and if anything of interest occurs, it works the rest of it. It took me a, a long time for him to confide in me enough for me to understand just how much he hated people that had less intelligence than him. And he absolutely demanded certain things and certain control and I believe when the family moved in next door he had no control over them as time went on the detective came to believe that tree pal had poisoned his neighbors but she could find no proof the undercover work was expected to take a few weeks but it stretched on for eight months without a breakthrough then, George Tripal and his wife moved about 40 miles away to Sebring, Florida. In December 1989, they allowed the detective, whom they knew as Sherry, to rent their house in Alturas. I actually paid for the home and moved into it. And I brought our crime scene unit and some detectives with me, went to the home, and we looked at just about every inch of it. They didn't need a search warrant since Tripal had given his tenant free reign of the property. Anything they found was sent off to the FBI lab for testing. Moving into Tripal's home finally allowed the detective to confront her suspect about the Carr family poisoning. A surveillance team videotaped a meeting between Sherry and her new landlord. I think you neglected to tell me something. Oh, what's that? that something had happened in the neighborhood. I had a lot of well-meaning people scare me out of my wits. Oh, oh yeah, somebody got poisoned next door. So, uh, that might not be a lot to you, but it's a lot to me. Oh, oh well, sorry. <laughs> you weren't afraid, were you? No. Um, apparently, it was some sort of personal vendetta. I mean, it's not like uh, they're running around poisoning everybody. No one knew that the crime had not been solved. And for him to say that was very, very interesting to me. At that point, there was really no doubt left in my mind that he was the one that had done it. The detective sensed something unusual in Tree Pal's behavior. His whole demeanor during this meeting was totally different from any conversation we had ever had. He was rather sharp and abrupt with me. 
Gorek told Tripal that investigators had come looking for him at his old house. To the detective, Tripal seemed unusually distracted. He kept asking what the investigators wanted. The only reason they could be interested in me, of course, would... Uh, and they didn't tell me what it was in reference to. Oh, of course. Uh, oh, what I'm doing is just working through various possibilities. I'm working on okay. the moment. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, if they're interested in me, it would be because of the... Uh, probably for us the next door, two years ago, which... Um, just because I lived in the area and I guess that's that. I hope I'm not a fine suspect. <laughs> that could be messy. When they were done talking, Gorick thought her suspect appeared shaken. The time is 11.30 and he's leaving. He's very worried. Soon after the meeting, the test results came back on the items taken from Tree Pelt's home. The FBI discovered that a bottle found in his garage contained small traces of thallium. That was enough to arrest George Tripa. Investigators knocked on the door of his new home in Sebring, Florida. His wife answered the door. George Tripa was standing in the top of the stairways in a blue pair of bikini underwear. Nothing else. We explained to him that we have warrants for his arrest. And his only response to us was, okay, is it okay if I put some clothes on? When authorities searched the home, they discovered apparently incriminating material. We found many chemicals, and I'm talking bottles and bottles and bottles of chemicals and different containers, um, some of them more exotic than others. Detectives also came across a binder of photocopied pages from a book called poison detection in human organs. They contain detailed information on the effects of various poisons, including thallium. The pages were covered with George's fingerprints. They also found a hidden basement room that contained a wooden table with stirrups. The windows had been sealed and the walls heavily insulated. Detectives thought it looked like a torture chamber. Although unrelated to the poisoning, it seemed to reveal a dark side to George Tripal. It was quite evident from what I'd seen. It was, it was used for s and purposes or, or torture purposes. Also coupled with the fact that we had found bondage items, gags and whips and riding crops and all types of bondage tools. When this discovery was later revealed in the press, Tripal's friends said there was a reasonable explanation. A torture chamber? I don't think so. I mean, I hate to tell you, I'd hate for you to look through my videos, but we have some uh, X-rated videos as well. I'd hate for you to look through the drawer in my bedroom table. We have some devices, and I think that most married people do. Yet they consider these devices as being torture. On April 7, 1990, George Tripal was charged with first-degree murder in the death of Peggy Carr and the attempted murder of the other Carr family members. He was ordered held without bail. The prosecution announced it would seek the death penalty for George Tripal, but questions still remained over whether the circumstantial case would convince a jury. His trial is next. In April 1990, in the small town of Alturas, Florida, there was news of a break in the poisoning murder of Peggy Carr. The arrest of neighbor George Tripal shocked the surviving members of Peggy Carr's family. Some thought Tripal could not be the perpetrator. I seen it on TV, them walking George Tripal in his orange outfit into the Polk County Jail. The same guy that I trusted and mowed his driveway, and this guy wouldn't do this. He's not that way. He's not a cold-blooded killer, you know? He might be a little weird, he might be a little nerdy, but he's not a killer. The trial began in January 1991 in the Polk County Courthouse. Prosecutors sought the death penalty for what they described as an especially heinous crime that put many people at risk. 
From the beginning, defense attorneys suspected that the jury would have a hard time feeling sympathy for an eccentric individual such as George Trepo. Geniuses who hang out together and don't allow the regular folk to be part of their club um, probably would tend to have a little bit more difficult time gaining the trust of jurors. In court, Trepal showed little emotion, occasionally smiling. Some jurors admit that they found his presence unsettling. Even though the defendant never spoke in the trial, his appearance and demeanor and actions spoke for him in a lot of ways. When you looked in his eyes, which he didn't look at us a lot, but when you did, there was something peculiar about it, something eerie, like the, this was all going on around him and he was oblivious to it almost. In his opening statement, Prosecutor John Aguero told the jury that they were going to hear the story of a brilliant man who was arrogant enough to believe he could get away with poisoning his neighbors. He said the evidence would show that only one person could have laced the eight-pack of Coca-Cola with thallium. The strategy overall was to begin with the whole world as suspects and as time went through in the trial and the testimony to narrow that so that by the time we got to the end of the trial the jury would believe that only one person in the entire world could have had the motive the opportunity and the knowledge to commit this crime key evidence presented by the state included the thallium bottle found in tree pal's garage and the book found in his house describing thallium poisoning in detail. Investigators testified about Trepal's deceptive behavior during his first interview with them, and Detective Susan Gorick recounted her undercover work. George Trepal did not take the stand, but the surveillance video played in court allowed jurors to hear the defendant talking about the poisoning. Oh, oh yeah, somebody got poisoned next door. That might not be a lot to you, but it's a lot to me. Oh, oh well, sorry. <laughs> Prosecutors also presented the anonymous threats received by the Carr family, together with the pamphlet from Tree Pal's Mensa Murder Mystery Weekend. It was striking that the language in the note uh, matched almost word for word the language that was in that pamphlet that we knew for a fact George Tree Pal wrote. You try to get juries uh, as much as you can to rely on their common sense in deciding what evidence to believe. Defense attorneys countered that Trepal became the focus of the investigation not because of the evidence, but because, quote, his greatest crime may have been his eccentricity. The defense maintained that detectives made a snap decision about his guilt during their first interview. They thought that he acted strangely. They testified that he, his mouth was dry, that he wouldn't look them in the eye. George was always like that. They didn't know it at the time. But they believed that he was so strange that from that day forward, they never investigated anybody else. Trepal's lawyers insisted that the state's evidence was unconvincing, that even the bottle with thallium traces in it proved nothing. Someone else could have put it there. It just simply doesn't make sense that this guy who's supposed to be a genius would leave a bottle of thallium in his garage next door to the pie car house that doesn't make any sense no fingerprints were found on the bottle in an interview for a tabloid tv show Trepal's wife defended her husband the physical evidence was not in our home it was in an unlocked garage which as far as i know has never been locked in the last 20 years they found it four months after we'd moved out um, they didn't find any fingerprints on it or rather they forgot to keep the fingerprints on the bottle so they really anybody could have put it there the prosecution conceded that there was no way to link the bottle of thallium directly to the car family poisoning while we couldn't prove that was the bottle we could prove he had in his possession thallium one nitrate thallium one nitrate it was what was in the coca-colas in their closing argument the defense pleaded with jurors to pay close attention to the lack of direct evidence. In a surprising move, the defense pointed a finger at George's wife, Diana. In reference to the bottle containing thallium, they asked, 
How do you assume that it was his and not hers? I believe now, and I think I will always believe, that she was as good of a suspect as George. Um, George did not want us to point the finger at Diana. Um, and we did not actively pursue that course throughout the, the main part of the trial. By the end of the trial, the defense decided that their client's best interests outweighed his request. In his closing argument, Prosecutor John Aguero argued that a striking amount of coincidences pointed to George Treatwell as the culprit. It was just little things, as I explained, you know, in closing that I called them coincidences, little things that in and of themselves don't necessarily hold significance, but to think that all those could coexist in one set of circumstances, it begins to boggle the mind that you can have that many coincidences. On February 5th, 1991, the case went to the jury. Six hours later, they returned with a verdict. Guilty on all counts, including the first degree murder of Peggy Carr. Outside the court, Peggy Carr's family reflected on her death. It's been a long, hard struggle. Peggy was in hell. She, you'd have to have seen her to know what she went through. And I'm glad it's over with. Of course, it wasn't over yet. Jurors still had to recommend a sentence. Life in prison or death. In February 1991, a jury in Bartow, Florida, found George Trepal guilty in the poisoning murder of Peggy Carr and the attempted murder of the rest of the Carr family. The eccentric genius faced a possible death sentence. Some of Trepal's friends believe the jury convicted Trepal because they thought he was strange. But jurors Bob Wall and Jay Mertz say their decision was based solely on the evidence. Each one of the jury uh, had the same impression. He was a very intelligent man, George Trepal. And uh, he had the background where he'd do it. He uh, had the knowledge working with Thallium. He was the only one in that vicinity that could do that. And I think that's basically what put him away. It was damning evidence with the totality of all this uh, circumstantial evidence. There was no doubt. No doubt. The court reconvened for Trepal's sentencing. His defense team declined to call any character witnesses because they feared counterattacks. There was a great deal of evidence that we had kept out about oddities about George that would have perhaps come into evidence had we attempted to go that route. But this decision also meant that the jury would not hear anyone speak on Trepal's behalf, including friends like Holly Horton. In the trial, people said they had seen him angry. All I can say, I, has, I have never seen him angry. I have never seen him be hurtful or spiteful to anyone or anything. I have seen him being extraordinarily kind. At the time, Florida was one of a small number of states where judges were not bound by a jury's recommendation in capital cases, and only a majority vote was needed to recommend death. Juror Jay Martz says the deliberations provoked strong emotions. It was heavy, and the lines were drawn with, amongst the jurors about what was appropriate. He will never poison anybody again, and that's the only good for the death penalty, but sometimes I think it's appropriate, and in this case in particular. The jurors finally voted 9 to 3 in favor of death. Robert Wall was one of the jurors who voted against the death penalty. This was all circumstantial evidence. Now, don't get me wrong, it all pointed to George Tripal, but there was no concrete evidence that he'd done it. The evidence was all that he could do it, and he was probably the only one, and that probably was a big word that stood out for me. On March 6, 1991, following the jury's recommendation, Judge Dennis Maloney announced the sentence. The governor of the state of Florida, by his warrant, shall direct that the defendant, George James Trepow, be electrocuted until he is dead. When the, the verdict was read, 
George Trepow was had the same expression on his face as he did when he came in there. Just somber, no expression whatsoever. Trepow is now an inmate at the Union Correctional Facility in Rayford, Florida. His case is under appeal. One issue arose in 1997 when a whistleblower called attention to serious flaws in the FBI crime lab. Trepal's attorneys believe the evidence against Trepal was faulty. Trepal's appeal lawyers contend that Roger Marks, the FBI expert, was the only person who linked the Coca-Cola bottles to Trepal. The Justice Department's report said that some of Marks's work in the Trepal case was inaccurate. Roger Martz had concluded that a particular kind of thallium, thallium nitrate, was found in both the Coke bottles and the bottle in Trepal's garage. FBI experts later conceded that Martz's work was careless, but they remain convinced that thallium nitrate was in the bottles tested. That issue, and others now on appeal, is working its way through the courts. From death row, Trepal has kept up his involvement with Mensa, writing a monthly column for the group's Florida newsletter, The Flame. He fills it with humorous stories and brain teasers. If all his appeals fail, Trepal will face execution at the state prison in Stark, Florida. Under state law, he could choose between lethal injection and the electric chair. Many of his fellow Mensa members still support him. It's, it's a hard thing to think of, friend, of having a friend with a death, death sentence hanging over him. It really is. Every time I, I hear about another execution, think about it. Peggy Carr's son, Dwayne, says time has not softened the heartache of his mother's awful death by poisoning. Mother's Day comes around and you think, okay, this year I'm not going to be upset. You can't get around it. That's all you think about all day long. What's going to happen when my son asks me, you know, where's, you know, where's my grandma? Where's Mimi at, you know? I don't know, son. Somebody killed her. She's in heaven waiting on you. George Trepal declined our repeated requests for an interview. He still maintains his innocence, and his supporters point to the questionable work of the FBI crime lab as proof. But in March 2003, Trepal moved one step closer to execution. Despite the evidence that the FBI's chief toxicologist gave inaccurate testimony, the Florida Supreme Court ruled that Trepal was not entitled to a new trial. Trepal's appeals continue. I'm Bill.